only way to be saved is to know you're lost. Isn't that right? That's right. And thank God that when we realize we're lost, if we are willing to respond to a gracious Savior, we can be saved. Praise the Lord. Well, tonight's subject, I believe, is one of the most important ones in Bible prophecy. Can the living communicate with the dead? Turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 1, and we want to see what Jesus, who is the hero, the star of Revelation, says about this great important topic tonight. Can the living communicate with the dead? Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18. The Bible says, Revelation 1 and verse 18, I am he that lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. And so God is telling us here there's only one person who has the keys to this subject. It's not me, it's not you, it's not a church, it's Jesus Christ. And Jesus, who has been dead and who is alive, holds the keys of hell and of death. They're very important principle to understand. Now, as we think about life after death, the ultimate mystery, here we see U.S. News and World Report, life after death, sciences study, psychic hotline, call now channeling is becoming more and more of a part of our society today. Can we talk with those who have passed on? That's a good question. In People Weekly, October 25, 1999, almost 70 million Americans said they think it's possible to communicate with the dead. Even more and more television programs are featuring different ones who claim to be able to cross over and communicate with the dead, and it's startling to see the accuracy of some of their conversations. Now, notice how this is skyrocketing today, this belief in being able to talk with the dead. Here is the uh, contrast between a survey done in 1976 and in 1998, a period of 22 years, 1976, those who believe in spiritualism in America were 12% of the population. Today, it's over half. Astrology, 1976, 70%. Today, 37%. Reincarnation, 1976, 9%. Today, uh, over a quarter of Americans. Fortune telling, 4%, 1976. Today, almost a quarter of Americans believe in these things. We are seeing a meteoric rise of interest and excitement in being able to communicate with the dead. It's a phenomenon that seems like it's never going to end. It's going to spiral more and more out of control. And we're going to see why as we go through this subject tonight. Some time ago, back during the Vietnam War, there was a dear mother whose son had gone to the conflict and was fighting over in Vietnam. And one day she received a knock on her door. And the knock on her door, it was a military officer, and he came and he said, you know, are you Mrs. So-and-so? And she said, yes, I am. And she says, we have bad news. Your son is missing in action, and he's presumed dead. And she was, of course, shattered, and her life was thrown into turmoil, and her heart was filled with agony. And so she was a Christian lady, and she attended church regularly. And uh, one day her neighbor said to her, who was into uh, spiritualism, said, well, you know, your son is dead. Why don't you come with us? Because every Thursday, we talk with the dead, and you'll be able to talk and communicate with your son. And she didn't believe in that. She was a Christian. She says, no, I don't believe in that. I'm not going to go. But as the weeks went by, her neighbor was persistent. And week after week, her neighbor would kindly invite her to come to the seance that they were having that Thursday. Well, finally, one Thursday morning, she was so lonely and one thir Thursday morning, she was in still suffering so much grief. She says, what well, will it hurt? I'll go ahead and go with you. And so she went over, and they channeled, who the ones who were in charge, they channeled up a form of her son. And she got all excited, and it, that form smelled like her son. That form spoke like her son, and she began to ask questions, and she was amazed at the answers that were given. And pretty soon, as in that one time period, she began to believe and put her faith and her affections were drawn out after this form. And so the next Thursday, she was very eager. She could hardly wait to go again and have this communication in the next and the next. 
Well, this went on for a number of months. And one morning, she heard a knock on her front door. And she went to her front door, and she looked out, and there was her son standing there in his military uniform. And she said, what are you doing here today? This is not Thursday. I'm waiting for Thursday. Now, we might chuckle at that, folks, but that woman lost her faith in God over that experience. Can the dead speak to us? What does the Bible say? Jesus holds the keys in his hands, and we want to understand what the Bible says on this subject. You know, today there are so many different ideas. Some people believe that when you die, that's it. <laughs> You're just there. Never again are you going to live again. Other people believe when you die, you go right to heaven. Everybody, more and more people believe that everybody's going to go to heaven the moment they die. Other people believe when you die, if you haven't been good, you go straight to hell. Other people believe in reincarnation. Well, when you, when you die, if you, you know, weren't that good, then you come down in a lower form of existence. And if you did better, then you come in a higher form of existence. There are many different ideas about what people believe in this subject. But who has the keys of hell and of death? Jesus Christ, right in the Bible. So we're going to study that. Here tonight, we're not interested in what churches think or people think. Now, let's think of this. If when people die, there is no death, then there's no reason for a judgment. Because if a person goes immediately to their rewards upon death, there's no need of a judgment to go on before Jesus comes. And if people die and go on immediately after death, then there's no need of a resurrection. Because if people are already living in another form, there's no need of a resurrection there would be no need of the second coming of Jesus, no need of the cross, because Jesus died on the cross because sin, the wages of sin is what? Death. And so there'd be no need of a cross. And folks, there's no need with that thinking of Christianity. And that's one of the big reasons that more and more in Christian churches, New Age philosophies are becoming more and more rampant because of the false ideas that people have on this subject. Again, we want to stick real close to the Bible tonight and understand what God says. The Bible provides a clear answer. Turn to Revelation, if you would, with me now. And in chapter 12, let's notice what God says here. Revelation chapter 12, about how Satan deceives the whole earth. This is very powerful and important. Okay, Revelation 12 in verse 9. We'll begin here in verse 7, actually. Revelation 12 in verse 7, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought on his angels and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. The great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives, what does it say? The whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. When was it that Satan deceived the whole world? Do you remember? All the way back in the beginning in the Garden of Eden. And it was on this subject. So let's turn there. Genesis, first book in your Bible, chapter 3. And let's notice what the Bible teaches about this amazing subject. Genesis chapter 3. And notice here beginning in verse 1. Okay, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. The Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, has God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now don't miss verse 4. The serpent said unto the woman, you shall not, what does he say? Surely die. Now, Satan didn't say they wouldn't die. He just said they wouldn't surely die. In other words, you die, but not really. And folks, that lie that began right there in the Garden of Eden has been spread, and all the world is deceived. Just like we already studied a couple weeks ago that all the world is wondering after this beast over here, and all the world has accepted a false system of worship, and they don't even know it. And so here we see another incredible deception that Satan would bring upon the whole world. Notice what it says in verse 5. For God does know that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And so Satan opened up this incredible deception with Adam and Eve bought into and they ate that fruit. And so let's think about 
as subject. God said they would surely die. The devil said they would not surely die. Who are we going to believe when we say this subject? The devil or Jesus? What do you think? I believe we ought to believe God with all my heart. There's no question about that. And so when God said that, he meant that. He wasn't just trying to play with their minds. He meant that with all of his heart. Now, this doctrine of the immortality of the soul can be traced through the muddy channels of a corrupted Christianity, a perverted Judaism, a pagan philosophy, and superstitious idolatry to the great instigator of mischief in the Garden of Eden. The Protestant barter from the Catholic, the Catholic from the pagans, and the pagans from the old serpent who first preached the doctrine amid the lowly bowels of paradise to an audience all too willing to hear and heed the new and fascinating theology. You shall not surely die. That was Amos Phelps, a Methodist Congregationalist minister. And folks, that is becoming more and more of a, of, of a belief in people today. More and more people just believe that everybody's going to go to heaven. Nobody's going to die. You just go on from one place to another and don't worry about a thing. Folks, we're missing more and more in our society the bedrock of truth in God's holy word. It's so important to be grounded in the Bible and in God's word. Now turn to Genesis uh, chapter 2 now. And let's notice how God created Adam and Eve. Because there's some real insights here into how God created Adam and Eve on this subject. Okay, Genesis 2 and verse 7. It's up here on the screen, but in your Bible. Genesis 2 and verse 7. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Isn't that beautiful? God spoke everything else into existence, but when he created human beings, he formed from the dust of the ground Adam, and then it says he breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, and Adam became a living soul. Notice the Bible does not say we have a soul. The Bible says that we are souls, okay? Very important Bible teaching. A lot of people have never studied into this from the Bible and the Bible alone. And so the dust of the ground plus the breath of life equals a living soul. Very simple equation there. So the body plus the breath equals a living soul or a living person. That's what a soul really is. The elements of the earth, God's power, a living being. A living soul means a living person. Okay, Job 27 and verse 3. All the while my breath is in me and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. So in the Bible, God says that the Spirit of God, not the Holy Spirit, but the Spirit of God is the same as the breath of God that God puts into our nostrils that gives us life and makes us living souls. Now, we can illustrate this a little bit like with a light bulb. Now, when you go to the hardware store and you buy a new light bulb, is it shining in the package, yes or no? Okay, what that light bulb, it has a filament, it has the glass, and it has the ability to give light, but there's no light in it. Why not? There's no electricity, right? And so you plug that light bulb in, the electricity flows into the light bulb, and what happens? You got light. Now, what happens when you pull out the plug or shut the switch off? Where does the light go? It ceases to exist, right? It dies. And that's the way it is when a human being dies. What happens when someone dies? Turn to Ecclesiastes now. Ecclesiastes is right after Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, about halfway through your Bible. Ecclesiastes shows us this process in reverse and what happens. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, and let's notice here verse 7. It's up on the screen, but it would be great if you can see it in your Bibles. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 7. Okay, the Bible says, Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 7, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit of God, or the Spirit, shall return unto God who gave it. So when a person dies, their body goes back into the earth, and the Spirit goes back to God. Now somebody says, there it is. When a person dies, they go straight up to heaven. Well, I've got this concordance here. By the way, everybody knows this is Gareth's concordance, right? I just want to make sure he gets it back tonight. But a concordance is an invaluable tool for studying the Bible. See, most people believe what they believe just because that's what they've been told or that's what everybody else thinks. But you're going to look anything up here in the Bible, any word and what it means. So I'm going to look up the word spirit. Because we want to see what the word spirit means in the Bible. 
There are many, many different um, usages of spirit, but here we have it. Okay, and what's this verse we just looked up? Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 7, right? So it gives you the number in the Hebrew dictionary, 7307. Okay, so I'm going to look here in 7307 in the Hebrew dictionary. 7307. Okay, I'm going to look up the word for spirit. 7307. Okay, and it's the word ruach. I'm going to put it up here on the screen. And it means wind, breath, or exhalation. That means so that's what the word spirit means in the Bible. Wind, breath, or exhalation. Wind, breath, or air. Okay, that's right here in the Strong's. You can buy it in any Christian bookstore. Okay, that's the Hebrew. Now, I'm going to put it up here on a screen, and I want you to see here what it is. I'm going to skip. Okay, here's the word. It's the word ruach. There's going to be Hebrew scholars here tonight. And it's used 377 times in the Bible. 117 times it's translated as wind or air. 33 times it's translated as breath, and 227 times it's translated as spirit. But according to the Hebrew meaning, it means wind, breath, or air. So when a person dies, their body goes back to the ground, but the spirit that goes back to God is not a living being or a living entity. According to the Bible, it is the breath of life, the breath that God puts in every human being when they begin to live. It goes back to God when they die. It's very plain and very simple, okay? Death is creation in reverse. Now, sometimes people say, well, Rick, how can that be? What about the everlasting soul or the eternal soul or the immortal soul? Man, that's everywhere taught in the Bible, isn't it? Well, we're going to look up every time the word immoral, I'm sorry, immortal is found in the Bible. Immortal, okay? Don't worry, I'll get you out of here on time tonight. Turn now with me, if you would, to the book of 1 Thessalonians. Because right, I'm sorry, 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1. Here we're going to begin this search in the Bible for every time the word immortal is used. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 17, okay? 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 17. The Bible says, 1 Timothy 1, 17, Now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So according to the Bible, who is immortal? God, okay? That's very clear. And folks, that's it. It's only used once in all the Bible. And it's applied to God alone. Turn to chapter 6 now, because the word immortality is used four times. I'm going to show you one right here. 1 Timothy 6, verses 15 and 16. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only has immortality, dwells in a light which no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. So here again, who alone has immortality at this time, according to the Bible? God alone, okay? And here we see a few more verses here. Only God has immortality. We just read it there. We seek immortality. That's found in Romans 2, verse 7. This mortal will put on immortality on resurrection morning. We're going to look into that in just a little while. 1 Corinthians 15. Now, turn to Ezekiel with me, if you would. That's just before Daniel in the Old Testament. And let's see what God teaches very clearly on this subject. Ezekiel, just before Daniel, chapter 18. Okay, the Bible is very plain and very clear on this subject. Because remember, we want to see what the Bible says, what God says, because Jesus holds the keys of hell and the grave in his hands. Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 4. Notice what it says just before Daniel, Ezekiel 18, 4. Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sins, it shall go straight to heaven. Is that what it says? I'm glad you picked that up. The soul that sins, it shall go straight to hell. Is that what it says? No. The soul that sins, it shall die. Look at verse 18. Same thing. Uh, verse 20. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20. The Bible says, Ezekiel 18, 20, the soul that sins, it shall die. And so the Bible is very clear in this point. Human beings are mortal. We're not immortal at this time. We're mortal. Job 14, 17, Romans 6, 12, Romans 8, 11, 2 Corinthians 4, and verse 11. So where did this teaching of immortality come from 
Folks, it doesn't come from the Bible. It comes from the ancient pagan sun worshipers, starting back there in Egypt, and it was believed in pagan doctrine of the immortality of the soul. That's why if you had enough money, you made sure you got buried, uh, embalmed and buried in one of those pyramids over there. And if you had a, a lot of money, you could leave in your will that they would kill a beautiful lady. If you were a guy, they'd kill a beautiful young lady and they had bomb her and they put that, her down there with you so you could have your own, uh, you know, uh, woman with you. And they would put all the money and gold. Some of you heard of King Tut's tomb. When they found King Tut's tomb, it was loaded with gold. But King Tut was sitting there just the way he went 3,000 years ago. He was still sitting there in the tomb because the Bible says the soul that sins, it shall die. And so then the Egyptians pass it on to the Babylonians. The Babylonians pass it on to the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans. And from pagan Rome during the Dark Ages, it went right into papal Rome. And it's been passed down in the Christian church ever since that time. Now, how does the Bible re repeatedly refer to death? Psalm 13 and verse 3, the Bible says, Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Light my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of of death. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2, many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So 66 times in the Bible, God refers to death as a sleep. And we know this because Jesus did the same thing. Notice what it says now in John, the gospel of John chapter 11. As we turn to John, the gospel of John chapter 11, notice how Jesus refers to death. We'll begin here with verse 11. John, the Gospel of John, chapter 11 and verse 11. This is the Bible now. We're studying what the Bible says. John 11 and verse 11. These things said he, and after that he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he does well. Howbeit Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest and sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Now, that's what the Bible says. Jesus called Lazarus, uh, death asleep, and then it says plainly, Lazarus is dead. 66 times in the Bible. Here's a real man named Lazarus. He is sleeping, Jesus says, and then he said plainly, Lazarus is dead. Now, look, I want you to notice here as we go on in verse uh, 23. Okay, Jesus finally came there, and he, he, he was there with Mary and Martha. He's here with Martha and, uh, well, verse 21, chapter 11, verse 21. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever you will ask of God, God will give it to you. Jesus said unto her, your brother shall rise again. Now listen to Martha's response. Verse 24, Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So Martha understood the Bible teaching that her brother would rise at the last day. Now, Jesus was going to raise him here in this experience. In verse 43, and when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Now, the Bible records very clear in verse 44. He that was dead came forth. Now, folks, if Lazarus had gone straight up to heaven the New Testament would have been filled with his testimony. Chapter after chapter after chapter would be there. Lazarus describing a great deal but it was what it was like. But not one word is mentioned here because the Bible says he was dead. But he came forth bound hand and foot with grave clothes. And so according to the Bible, those who have died are sleeping in death waiting for the resurrection. Turn to Acts chapter 2 if you would. Because the Bible here in Acts 2 reinforces what we've been studying. This is Peter, and Peter was just anointed by the Holy Spirit, and he's preaching on the day of Pentecost. And Peter, under the inspiration of the power of the Holy Spirit, Pentecost, outpouring of the Holy Spirit, listen to what he's preaching here. Verse 29, Acts chapter 2 and verse 29. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David. Now, is David a saved man? Yes or no, according to the Bible. Absolutely, folks, right there in uh, Hebrews chapter 11, he's a saved man. He says, uh, but he is both dead and buried in his sepulcher is with us unto this day. And when Peter was preaching there in the temple steps, he could look over and see David's sepulcher right there in Jerusalem. Look at verse 34. For David is not ascended into the heavens, 
But he said himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand. So Peter, under the inspiration of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, makes it plain. David was resting in the grave, waiting for the resurrection. So where did the dead go when they died? Here's Martin Luther, one of the great Protestant reformers, in his book, The Christian Hope, page 37. We shall sleep until he comes and knocks on the little grave and says, Dr. Martin, get up. Then I will rise in a moment and be happy with him forever. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. I'd like you to turn there if you could with me. That's just again after Psalms and Proverbs and then Ecclesiastes. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9, the Bible is very plain and very clear on this subject. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and beginning in verse 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 5. Right there after Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Chapter 9 and verse 5. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. For In verse 10. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. And so according to the Bible, when a person dies... They're resting in the grave, unconscious until the resurrection. Now, the question we want to ask now, is anyone in heaven tonight who lives on this earth? Because if there is ever an exception to what God clearly teaches, and there are hundreds and hundreds of verses in the Bible, not three or four, but hundreds and hundreds, that clearly teach what we're studying here tonight. Now, if there's an exception, God would surely tell us. So turn in your Bibles, if you would, back to the book of uh, Genesis, chapter 5. Because the Bible tells us about two people who never died. They went to heaven without dying. Genesis, chapter 5, and notice what it says here in verse 24. Genesis, chapter 5, and verse 24. Right there in the beginning of the Bible, Genesis 5, verse 24. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. So Enoch went up. He never died. He never died. And in 2 Kings chapter 2, the Bible tells us that Elijah the prophet went up and he never died. Two people went to heaven, they never died. Now the only way they could do that was through the grace that Jesus would bring in the future, in their day. Okay? But what about those who have died? Well, the Bible tells us about one person and a small group. Turn with me now, if you would, to the book of Romans. And let's notice what it says here about Moses. Romans chapter 5 and verse 14. Romans is right there after Acts and then Romans and then Corinthians. Romans chapter 5 and verse 14. This is very, very beautiful as God reveals it here. Romans 5 and verse 14. The Bible says, Romans 5, 14, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who was the figure of him that was to come. So according to the Bible, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Well, what happened to Moses? We know from the Bible that Moses died. But turn now with me, if you would, to the book of Jude, which is just before Revelation. Because Jude reveals some astounding truth to us of what God did with Moses. Okay, Just before Revelation, Jude is only one chapter. And we'll see it here, Jude, in verse 9. Notice what it says here. There's Elijah. Okay, Jude, in verse 9. The Bible says, Jude, verse 9, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. So we've got Michael the archangel. He's disputing with the devil, and they're disputing who is going to have the body of Moses. Did not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Now, folks, when God is in a dispute with the devil, who's going to win? God is, okay? And so here, God shows us that he raised Moses, and he resurrected him. And Moses was one of those ones who was there on that mount with Elijah. There was Elijah and Moses who came to encourage Jesus before Jesus went to the cross. But there's one other small group that the Bible tells us about, Matthew 27, verse 52 when Jesus died, the Bible says the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. We don't know this for certain, but Revelation talks about the 24 elders. 
and they were obviously redeemed from this earth. And so it appears that that group that was specially raised at Jesus' death, and then they went and gave testimony to Jesus' resurrection, are part of that group. So Elijah, Enoch, Moses was resurrected, and this small group, that's it, everybody else, folks, according to the Bible, is resting in the grave, waiting for the resurrection. Now, if the devil is going to deceive the whole world at the end, he's got to bring this belief more and more to more people, to the masses, that when you die, you don't really die. That's why the, ra- the, uh, 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 the rising up of new ages becomes so profound today. Shirley MacLaine, she's getting uh, quite older now, but she was very influential in this uh, rise that you don't really die. Now, spiritism claims the dead are not dead. The fundamental principle of spiritism is that human beings survive bodily death and that occasionally under conditions not yet fully understood, we can communicate with those who have gone on before. That's J. Arthur Hill from Spiritism, History, Phenomena, and Doctrine. There is no death in the graveyard, spiritism teaches. I have frequent talks with the dead. That's spiritism. He would see a stone over there at the birthplace of modern spiritualism. That's in Rochester, New York. There is no death. There are no dead. Now, who said that in the garden? Did God say that or did Satan say that? Satan said that right in the garden. This is what Shirley MacLaine teaches and believes, like millions and millions. I believe that souls, invisible entities, are a part of the cyclical harmony of nature. None of it ever dies. It just changes forms. More and more, we're seeing spiritualism become Hollywood. We see it more and more in, in the, even in the Christian church. It's happening. But what does the Bible say happens when person dies. Job chapter 7 and verse 8, the eye of him that has seen me shall see me no more. Your eyes are upon me and I am not. According to the Bible, folks, when a person dies, you're not going to see him anymore. Okay? Job 7 verses 9 and 10, as the cloud is consumed and vanishes away, so he that goes down to the grave shall come up no more. God says when they go down to the grave, they're not coming up anymore. He shall return no more to his house, neither shall his place know him anymore. They're not going to go back to their house. According to the Bible, verse 10, he shall return no more to his house, neither shall his place know him anymore. Job 21, 32, yet shall he be brought to the grave and shall remain in the tomb. Job 14, 21, his sons sons come to honor and he knows it not. They are brought low and he perceives it not of them. And so we read earlier tonight, Revelation 12, 9, the old servant called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. Folks, the whole world is deceived as we see there tonight on this issue in spiritualism. And it's rampant. I'm going to show you some slides now that are shocking. Satanists believe in the pagan doctrine of the immortality of the soul. What about, do you believe in miracles? What about the apparitions of Mary? All over the world, there are hundreds of millions, yea, over a billion that are believing that Mary is coming back with messages from God. Here we see Hail Mary. Catholics have long revered her, but now Protestants are finding their own reasons to celebrate the mother of uh, Jesus. Mary, co-redemptrix, meteorix of all graces and advocate. More and more people, our attention is being focused on Mary and Mary's, these apparitions that are happening. Over a hundred nations of the world have documented apparitions of appearances of what is supposed to be Mary. And there are tens of thousands of others that have not been documented. Here we see one down in Conyers, Georgia, and Mary Fowler on her farm, 100,000 for a number of years. People would come by the, the slough just to come to see an apparition of Mary. Visions of Mary attract cloud, uh, crowds, light from heaven, Uh, Here's the book, Thunder of of Justice. Mary has said she will appear, if necessary, in every single household. Here we see the Son, Virgin Mary's urgent message for all mankind. Here's from Mary's message to the world, Annie Kirkwood. Tell others there is no devil, page 280. Heaven and hell are simply mental states, page 195. In one lifetime, Joseph was a monk in Spain. We have all lived many lives, page 84 and 85. The real message, how to prepare ourselves for our re-entry into the spirit world after physical death. These messages are purported to come from Mary. But according to the Bible, where is Mary? Mary's sleeping in the grave. Mary's waiting for the resurrection. So where are these messages originating from? They're certainly not originating from God. And what's happening more and more, people are being drawn to the supernatural. And if something is supernatural, they believe it's got to be from God. They believe it's got to be true. 
But I'll tell you what, folks, we've already learned. Jesus has warned us about the last days. He said if it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. And he calls us to test everything by the Bible, not by our feelings, not by our emotions, not by what seems right, but by the word of God. And so we see this deception is huge in the world tonight. Here's another one on the immaculate misconception. About 7,000 people gathered. I can't pronounce that, last guy, that guy's last name. Joseph in Marlboro, New Jersey, home on August 2nd to see the Virgin Mary appear. She did not. This man claims that the mother of Christ, sometimes accompanied by St. Joseph, has been visiting him on the first Sunday of every month for the past year and a half. St. Joseph apparently sports a cutoff shirt, short pants, and a wide belt. But in Revelation 16, notice what God says. He says, For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth. Jesus says in Matthew 24, 24 and 25, there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before, Jesus tells us ahead of time. Now the spirits speak ex expressly, 1 Timothy 4, 1, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Well, folks, as we think about this tonight, there's only one anchor that's going to keep us from being deceived. You're holding it in your hand, the Word of God. God's Word is our only safety in all matters, but especially in this one as we think it tonight. Now, we know there are good angels. The, the Bible is very clear. There are lots and lots of angels, but we also know there were a third of the angels, according to Revelation, kicked out of heaven. And they're no longer good angels, they're demons. And they have the power to impersonate people because if we have data banks, you better believe the devil has data banks. The devil's got better data banks than any human beings do. And they keep in those data banks the person's uh, life history, the person's feelings, the person's emotions, the person's knowledge. They know what kind of perfume or cologne the person wore, uh, uh, used. They know everything. And so they can personate people who have died. But according to the Bible, it can't be those people that are resting in the grave. They are doing it to deceive people. The devil's lie, you shall not surely die. But God says, if you eat this fruit, you're going to die. Now, some of you remember Herb Applegate, the hale Bop Comet. Listen to what he says. He was excited about his willful exit in order to enter the kingdom of God. Do you remember that incredible web of death? And so people are getting caught up in it. It's costing them their eternal life. Psalm 115, verse 17. The dead praise not the Lord, neither anything that go down in the silence. Folks, if I'm going to be in God's presence, that's all I'm going to be doing is praising the Lord. But the Bible says the dead praise not the Lord. Isaiah 38, 18. Death cannot celebrate you. Psalm 146, verse 4, his thoughts perish, 1 Corinthians 15. Let's turn there together. Now, as we think about this subject, there's a resurrection coming, folks. And when that resurrection comes, that is when God's people are going to be raised in the first resurrection, and the, those who have rejected God are going to be raised in the second resurrection. Everyone's going to live again, but they're not going to live as soon as they die. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51 what? Notice what it says, actually verse 50. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 50. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. According to the Bible, folks, we're going to be changed when the trumpet sounds and Jesus comes again, not until then. You see, the devil hates the resurrection. The devil hates this great reunion. And the devil is going to do everything he can to deceive people, not only that they'll be lost, but they won't see the beauty of God's wonderful truth. Now, somebody might be thinking about this time. They're saying, well, Rick, you know, I can see this is clear from the Bible. But, you know, I've been to funerals and I've heard preachers preach that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Well, let's go ahead and see what the Bible says on that. Turn to 2 Corinthians now, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 8. Because I'm here to tell you, folks, the Bible does not teach to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. When people are using that scripture, they're misquoting it. Let's see what it really says. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 
and verse 8. This is Paul speaking, by the way. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8. Paul says, We are confident, I say, and willing, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Does that verse say that we go right to heaven when we die? Yes or no? Does that verse say that as soon as we die, we're going to be present with the Lord? No, it doesn't. Paul says, I'm willing, rather, to be absent from this body and to be present with the Lord. Well, folks, any true believer is willing to be absent from this body and present with the Lord because our longing is to be with Jesus. But according to the Bible, Paul, the same writer as we just read there in 1 Corinthians, says that's going to take place when Jesus comes, not when we die. I tell you, I'm looking forward to that time. I shared with you the other night, my mom just passed away last summer, July 15. I tell you, my mom, she was a rock in our family. If my mom had not accepted Jesus, our whole family would have been washed down the toilet. My mom, she loved the Lord. She suffered a lot. When Jesus comes, she's coming up out of that grave, folks. He's going to be an incredible reunion. My wife and I, our first son, his name is Elisha, and he died of crib death when he was just a little baby. And it was the darkest time of our whole life. It was a lot of pain and agony in our lives. But folks, when we laid little Elisha in the grave, we had that wonderful hope based on the word of God that when Jesus comes, there's going to be a resurrection and we're all going to be brought up together. And we're going to have the privilege of raising Elisha, not in a sinful world with his pain and heartache. We're going to get to raise him in heaven. What a wonderful gift. And we praise the Lord for that. And so God is showing us there's coming a time of a resurrection. Now think of this. If the dead know not anything, and that's crystal clear in the Bible, when the resurrection takes place, it's going to seem like we see Jesus the moment we die. Now think of that. Abel is the first Christian martyr. He died about 6,000 years ago. He was killed by his brother Cain. And Abel's been dead for 6,000 years. And we know he's a saved man because Hebrews chapter 11 tells us he was a saved man. He was a man of faith. So when Jesus comes and evil comes up out of the ground, it's going to seem like a moment of time. It's going to seem like he just dozed off for a split second. He's going to see Jesus. But folks, right now, Abel's not in heaven. He's sleeping in Jesus waiting for the resurrection. Now you think of how this is going to play out in the end. When Satan comes as Jesus, he personates Jesus. We know that, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And he's also going to raise up others. The demons are going to impersonate other ones, obviously, because there's going to be many false Christs, false prophets. And they come and they say to us that God's law has been changed or that part of God's law has been altered and that now under Jesus and these enlightened apostles who have, who have died, but now they're, res I mean, now they're b back here, they come back from heaven. How many people do you suppose are going to stand on the Bible and the Bible alone? I'll tell you what, folks. According to Jesus, very, very few. This Bible teaching is so important for us in these last days. It brings comfort to our hearts that someday we're going to be with those that we love, who love Jesus, and we can look forward to that resurrection day. But it warns us against the incredible deceptions of spirits who are, who are impersonating those who have died and it helps us to see that no matter what anybody says, turn to Galatians chapter 1 if you would quickly with me, because notice what Paul said. This is very important. This is powerful. Galatians chapter 1. Paul tells us something about following God's written word. Galatians chapter 1. And I want you to see here in verse, let's see, verse uh, 6. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 6. That's right after Acts and then Romans, then Corinthians, then Galatians. Galatians 1 and verse 6. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you that would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel of, from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be what? A curse. Paul says that anybody, it doesn't matter who they call themselves, it doesn't matter if they call themselves Jesus, it doesn't matter if they can work miracles, if they're preaching something other than this book, folks, what does God say? Let them be accursed. Don't get caught up. And so this spiritualism is Satan's other incredible, huge deception for the last days. We already found out last weekend that Sunday worship is a huge deception for the whole world. Because God's law has been changed, set aside by human beings, and it can't be because John saw it in heaven, right there in the throne room of God. Revelation 11, verse 18 and 19. And this teaching of spiritualism, that's why God sends the prophecy in Revelation so we can know Jesus and know the truth. 
And we won't be deceived. It's so beautiful and so precious. There's a resurrection coming. We're all going to heaven together. I want to look at a few verses here. Luke 14, 14. This is Jesus. And you shall be blessed, for they cannot recompense you, for you shall be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. That's when we're going to receive our reward. John 5, 28 and 29. All that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. This, John 6, 39, this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again, when does Jesus say? At the last day. Crystal clear. John 6, verse 40, this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which sees the Son and believes on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up when? At the last day, as John 6 and verse 40. Look at verse 44. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Over and over and over again, Jesus, the Creator, stressed this teaching. It's going to come when Jesus comes in the last day. It doesn't happen, folks, when we die. Here it is, verse 54 again. Whosoever eats my flesh, drinks my blood, has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Day. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 and 14. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, God will bring with him. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Praise the Lord. Folks, you talk about a reunion. All of the saved from all the, the time are all going up together. We're all going to praise God together. We're all coming to heaven. John 14, verses 1 to 3. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. 2 Timothy 4, 6 and 7. This is Paul, for I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not unto me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. It's going to happen when Jesus comes and the clouds of glory. Folks, we don't need to fear death. You know, when my mom was there, and she took her last breath, folks, the peace of God was on her face. The next split second, she knows she's going to see Jesus when Jesus comes in the clouds of glory. I don't know about you, but I get real tired sometimes. And when I go to sleep at night, and I get a nice, sweet night's sleep, and I wake up in the morning, folks, the time is gone. I don't even know it. You don't even know how long the time has been. But folks, God wants us to know we don't have to fear death when Jesus is in our heart. We don't need to worry about death when Jesus is in our heart because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And Jesus is our hope at that time. And God wants us to have that peace and truth in our heart. Now, somebody says, well, what about the thief on the cross? I thought that Jesus told the thief on the cross that they were going to be in heaven that day. Well, let's take a look at it. Turn to Luke in your Bible, if you would, chapter 23. And in Luke chapter 23, let's notice what the Bible says. Luke 23, beginning here in verse 42. Okay, Luke chapter 23, the Gospel of Luke chapter 23 and verse 42. You know, when I started studying the Bible, there were some things in it that I couldn't understand and there were things that seemed to contradict themselves. But the more I studied it, the more I realized if we'll let the Bible interpret itself, there is no contradiction. It's all in harmony. Luke 23 verse 42. And he said unto Jesus, this was the thief, Lord, remember me as soon as I take my last breath. Is that what it says? No, what does it say? Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He knew. He understood. But look at verse 43, because this is the one of controversy. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you, Today you shall be with me in paradise. And so folks say, well, there it is, right in the Bible. Jesus said he'd be with him in paradise. Well, I'm going to show you. Turn to John now, if you would. The Gospel of John, chapter 20. Because that could not be the way you read it there in that punctuation. Okay, John chapter 20, and notice what it says in verse 17. John chapter 20, Jesus has risen. It's the first day of the week, three days after he died, on the third day. John chapter 20, verse 17. Jesus said unto Mary, said unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. According to Jesus, the day he was resurrected, he hadn't gone to heaven yet. 
So how could Jesus tell the thief on the cross that he was going to be with him in paradise that day? Well, we're going to see it here. It's very simple and very plain. Okay, The Bible was not written with punctuation. The punctuation has been supplied by the translators. All the words are inspired by God, but the punctuation was not in the original manuscripts. It was added centuries later by the medieval church. Okay, So let's go ahead and put the comma in the right place to agree with what Jesus told Mary on the resurrection day. Luke 23, verse 43, Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you today, comma, you shall be with me in paradise. You see, the comma was put in the wrong place by the translators. And so when you put it in the right place, it is in total harmony with what Jesus said in John chapter 20 when he was talking to Mary. The Bible sometimes, there's sometimes the, the translators have made mistakes with commas. Now you say, well, what about the paradise of God? How do we know that's where Jesus was going to be? Revelation 2 verse 7 says, To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Jesus told the thief he'd be with him in paradise that day. The tree of life, according to the Bible, is in the midst of the paradise of God. Revelation 22 verses 1 and 2, He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and out of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, on either side of the river, there was the tree of life. So according to the Bible, the throne of God is where the tree of life is, which is the paradise of God. And Jesus told Mary on Sunday morning, three days after he died, he had not yet ascended to his father's throne. And so that comma, when you put it in the right place, clears up all the problem with that passage. The tree of life is close to the throne of God, therefore paradise is where God's throne is. Acts 19, here's another example of a comma being the wrong place. In your Bible there, in the King James, it says, So that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, comma, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Have you ever seen a sick handkerchief or a sick apron? What's happened here is they've left the comma out where they should have been. This is how it should read. So that from his body were brought unto the sick, comma, handkerchiefs or aprons, comma, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Occasionally, the punctuation in the Bible is not correct because the translators put the punctuation in. Folks, I'll tell you what. When I, was, when I became a Christian, I started studying the Bible. I said, God, either this book is all true or I'm going to throw it out. The problem is, the reason we've got all these different churches, over 2,000, is that people want to try to use the Bible to prove what they want it to say instead of putting aside our own preconceived ideas and letting the Bible interpret itself. And when we do that, there isn't a bit of a problem. It is all crystal clear. And so in Revelation 1 and verse 18, we come back to where we started. Jesus says, I am he that lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. Folks, we want to take our instruction on this vital topic for the last days from the Bible and the Bible alone because that's the only safe place to rest our faith. Oh, I'll tell you, you know, every one of us here, I know we've all lost people that are very dear to us. Maybe a mother or a father, maybe a son or a daughter, maybe a best friend, maybe a brother or a sister. And some of you even tonight may be grieving in your heart and you feel the loneliness and the longing to be with that person. God wants you to know that that person is not suffering right now. That person is not in agony right now. Sometimes people say, well, you know, it comforts me if I could believe that my loved one went right to heaven. Folks, if you went right to heaven tonight, if you died and you went right to heaven tonight, and you look down here on this earth and you see your family suffering. Let's say when somebody in your family has a tragic accident and they're in agony and pain, maybe they're paralyzed. Or you look down and you see one of your best friends develops cancer. Folks, people, if they went right to heaven when they died and looked down on this earth, there would not be pleasure for them. There would be agony and pain and sorrow as they saw those that they loved suffering and they couldn't do anything about it. God in His infinite wisdom and mercy has dealt with this sin problem so kindly and so lovingly. God in His infinite love knows that when a person dies, the kindest thing to do, the right thing to do, is let them be asleep in the grave, unconscious in the grave, where they don't realize time is passing, and the next moment they're going to see Jesus coming in the clouds of glory. Folks, that's the truth that Jesus gives us, and that's the truth that preserves us in these last days. You know, as we close tonight, I know, again, this has been a startling subject tonight, and God wants us to reflect very, very humbly on the Bible. And I invite you to bow your heads again with me tonight as we close. Just close your eyes. 
as we pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you that Jesus does hold the keys of hell and the grave. Jesus, we praise you tonight that you're at the Father's right hand. You're our intercessor. You're a high priest. You're a mediator. And we thank you, Jesus, that you have given us right in your holy word clear, unmistakable teaching that the dead know nothing. They're waiting for the resurrection. And Lord, we want to thank you for the blessed hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We thank you, Jesus, for your death, for our sins and our guilt. We thank you, Jesus, for your resurrection. And Jesus, we praise you as we receive you as both Savior and Lord that we can look forward with hope, with certainty, with excitement to your coming and the resurrection when those who have died with their hope and their faith in you, those who have died, who have had your spirit in their hearts, will be raised all together and we're all going to go home together. We're all going to praise you together, that great and glorious reunion. What a hope you've given us. And Lord, tonight I want to pray, if there's anyone here whose heart is aching tonight in loneliness, for pain, for the separation of someone who has passed away, someone who has died. Lord, I pray tonight that you'll bring comfort to their heart. Lord, tonight I pray that you'll bring hope to their heart. Father, tonight I pray that you will bring certainty to their heart. And Lord, I pray tonight you'll bring peace to their heart, that they can know absolutely for certain that those who have passed away are resting. The next moment, the next second, that they'll be aware of anything, they'll see Jesus coming in the clouds. Oh, Father, thank you, Jesus, for your truth. Thank you, Lord, that you've given us this truth in the Bible in the last days to preserve us from these incredible deceptions through spiritualism, through all these different appearings. And not only now, but folks, for Lord, as time in these last moments of earth's history, as Satan's deceptions get greater and more powerful, and even Satan will come as an angel of light personating Jesus, that we can know for absolute certainty that we stand on the Bible and the Bible alone. As Paul told us there in Galatians 1, verse 8, even if an angel from heaven were to say that there's some other gospel and some other truth, that we are not to be caught up with that and not to believe it. We are rest in your truth and your precious gift of truth. Oh, bless each one of us tonight. We thank you tonight as we can surrender our heart fully to Jesus, that he can be our hope in that wonderful day when Jesus comes. Jesus, that you can be our assurance. And Jesus, you can be our peace. And Jesus, you can be the one that we rest in, that it will be impossible for Satan and all the demons of hell to deceive us in these last days as we rest in you in your word. Bless each one, I pray tonight, if you would like to say, Jesus, I choose for you to be my righteousness, to be my hope, and to be my truth. I just invite you to raise your hand just now. Your head is bowed and your eyes closed. Just raise your hand up to heaven and put it down. Thank you, Jesus, that we can rest in you tonight. Bring us back, I pray, tomorrow morning that we may experience the blessedness, the pleasure, the joy, and the holiness and delight of your holy Sabbath day. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.